Joni, how are you this morning? How are you doing? I'm good. You're good. All right. Well, we were just talking about what we're going to talk about today. We're going to start off talking about lead generation. And specifically, what I realized from the survey that I sent out yesterday, and Joni, I know you filled it out, but for anybody who hasn't filled out that survey, please fill it out. This is going to help me help you. And it's also going to help me make sure that I have the program that you need it to be, right? So that's why that, that is really important. So if you filled it out for me already, I appreciate it. And if you haven't, please do that. But already, um, just from one day of some of the responses that came in, I realized that one of the issues that people are having is where they find, where their lead generation comes from. How are they looking for business? So the first thing I want to point out to you are some resources. Um, so if you go to mykwpc.com, which is your website for productivity coaching under resources, and then down here, you're going to see a class called 3612 in the first quarter of 2021, I taught this class on Saturday mornings at the workshop. And these are the recordings and the participant guides for that. And student materials. If you click on the student materials, what you're going to find is all of the, the student manuals for all of those things. And you're going to find a conversation about all different kinds of lead generation. So um, I think we can go in here and look at the recordings and we can see the list of the items, right? So we come down here and we start talking about first and foremost, your database. And so your database, we're going to cover that. Uh, tomorrow, I am in the Northeast office from 1.30 to 4.30 teaching a database class. On the 16th, which is Friday, I am in Louisville from 11 to three or 11 to two with a database class. And then next Saturday or next Wednesday, I mean, I am in on the 21st, I'm in the South office teaching that same class in person. Um, and it is going to be a couple of things. The first part of the class is going to be all about the concept of database and how you create a million dollar database, what you need to do to make sure you're getting the maximum results out of your database. And then the last hour or so of the class is going to be hands-on in command. So that's what those classes look like. So that's your database. And we've been talking about database. We all know that. So database and working with Mets. Then one of the ways that we can find business and find people that need our help is by choosing a neighborhood and farming it. So we choose a neighborhood and we farm it. And what we mean by farming it is we communicate with it regularly and consistently over a period of time. And so there are some things that you need to think about when you're farming a neighborhood. So let's see, we got some Debbie, I'm going to mute you because we're getting re reverb from you. Um, so you just have to unmute when you want to talk. All right. So tell me when we're talking about farming a neighborhood, what are some things that we need to consider if this is one of our ways we're going to lead generate? I think Number my biggest problem when it comes to farming is um, it's settling on a location. I tend to, I tend to get indecisive. <laughs> um, like my street in the last two years, I mean, I can't even, I live, well, I guess you're living in Indiana, not Louisville. Um, but my street has had so many different houses go up for sale and be sold by many different agents. There was not like really one agent that kind of mastered my my street but i guess i'm i guess i feel like too many houses were just literally previously sold even la even just this year so i guess i shouldn't sh i don't know i i guess i shouldn't go with my street well when you say per what percentage like as far as like how many houses sold how many houses in your neighborhood versus oh. how many have sold in the last year what's the percentage well, I didn't actually go and do the math. If I'm going okay. based off me we, physically seeing every day. Right. I mean, so we, we want to do the math. When we choose a neighborhood, we want to do the math, right? Okay. For instance, my neighborhood. I've lived in my neighborhood for 17 years, and I can think of four houses that ever sold in my neighborhood. That is not a good neighborhood to farm. And I laugh every time I get realtor stuff in my mailbox. And I usually get it one or two times and then they stop, which I, that also makes me laugh, right? Because I know neither of those strategies are going to work. Now, eventually the people in my neighborhood are going to start dying and moving off, but it's not a huge neighborhood. And the fact is most people, when they move here, they live here. They don't, they don't, it's not a transient neighborhood. There's not a lot of movement, right? So um, 
So my neighborhood was not one I ever, I ever farmed. I did farm a neighborhood. The neighborhood I farmed was one that had a lot of turnover. You want a neighborhood that has a lot of turnover. And these are usually neighborhoods that are first time home buyer neighborhoods, right? So first time no, home buyer neighborhoods are great to farm because they're gonna turn, right? First time home buyers, they're gonna buy not their forever home, right? They're most of the time, right? They're gonna be, they're gonna be moving. So we say, what, does anybody remember, what's the statistic? How often do people normally move according to NAR? Five to seven Five. years. Five to seven years. Now I'm wondering if that's gonna change because in the last couple of years, people were settling, buying homes that weren't the homes they wanted. So we may see that that's going to change a little bit, but five to seven years. So Alicia, if 10% of your neighborhood, if, if you have a lot, if you're seeing a lot of sales and you're not seeing an agent dominating the neighborhood, I'm thinking that's a really positive sign that that would be a great neighborhood to farm because people turn over a lot. You can also take a look and see what's the average holding time. Like you can go into tax records and see, take a sampling, right? This person just sold the house. When did they buy it, right? If they bought it two years ago, then that, that tells me this is a really a neighborhood that's moving quickly. But the biggest thing you have to remember when you farm a neighborhood is that you have to be consistent. Is farming a neighborhood mailing one postcard? No. No. How many touches do we need to have to a neighborhood to have a successful farming pro uh, system or product in place to have successful lead generation when we farm a neighborhood? Is it 12? It's actually 36. Oh, okay. It's the same as our 36 <laughs> touch, right? So 12 of those would be getting everyone in your neighborhood on what? Uh, mostly smart plan. Yes, a neighborhood nurture, right? So they're seeing what's happening in the neighborhood on a regular basis. What would four of your touches of those 36 touches be every year? Calls. Phone calls, right? So you have access to Mojo because you're in productivity coaching. You would go into Mojo. You would draw your neighborhood. The beautiful thing about Mojo is that it's going to it's going to run it through the do not call list. So you can't get in trouble with the TPC. A TPCA, TP, whatever it is, tell it, tell it, tell telephone consumer, whatever it is, the one that gives you fines. You're not going to get in trouble with them, right? FTC. TPCA. Is that what it is? TPCA. Uh, um, that, yeah. Yeah. So, so it's going to scrub that. You're going to add those people to your database. You're going to set up a smart plan that is your farming smart plan. And then what are you going to send them? So you've got 12 of your 36 that are your neighborhood nurtures. You have got four phone calls. What else might you do for neighborhood for neighborhood uh, farming? If you can get on their Facebook page, you can do neighborhood lives or Facebook lives on their neighborhood page. You absolutely could. I love that. What else? Debbie, what did you do on St. Patrick's, Patrick's Day? I, I, what did I do for St. Patrick's Day? Is that what you said? In your neighborhood, uh, yeah. Um, myself and another neighbor dressed up like little leprechauns and we walked around the neighborhood and I did, I think I did a total of three Facebook lives as I was hiding, um, like bags that had like cheap little stupid, um, St. Patrick's Day jewelry. But then there was a note inside of it, um, that said you've won a Starbucks gift card, but they had my name and number my card in there. So they had to contact me and they also had to put it on the Facebook page that they had won just a picture or they could have done a live post or something, but just that they had won this. Um, and then I delivered it to their home. So I had their name, their address, their phone number, cause they had texted me to tell me. Um, and then at the end of it, I did like just a big finale. I just did like a um, stay posted, see what we're up to. And then at the end, I did a, a post that said, this is what I've done. And I hit like four things around the neighborhoods in the common areas. I made sure to stay out of people's yards and did that and people absolutely loved it. I love that. As far as yards go, I used to live in a neighborhood before I bought this house where there was a realtor and I still remember her name. She's retired, but every year, and I cannot remember if it was Memorial Day or Labor Day, but it doesn't matter, but she would come in the middle of the night and next to all of our mailboxes, she would put little cheap little flags, American flags that had like a label of her business card on the stem of it. And so you'd get up in the morning and you would leave your house and you would look down your street and there were these flags everywhere. And then of course you were gonna go see who did this and you saw their name, right? Now what she didn't do well 
was that she didn't do other things. That was the one thing that she did every year. And that wasn't enough because do you guys remember how, how long does it take for somebody to forget you? 13 days. 13 days, right? So that she did that once a year. I can remember what she did, but I can't remember her, right? So that's the mistake there. Um, okay, just listed, just sold. When you get your first activity in that neighborhood, then you want to send out just listed and just sold. You want to you want to door knock the neighborhood once or twice a year, right? So that you can meet the people that you can't call. You're going to meet the people that are on the do not call list, right? And maybe you can get permission. Remember, even though they're on the do not call list, if you get permission to communicate with them, then you're not going to get in trouble, right? You have to have a system. It's not a one and done. It's not a hit and miss. You have to have a system. You have to commit to it. And you're going to have to commit to at least a year before you can see. You may get results right out of the gate, right? But remember in real estate, what's the rule? Slowly then. Suddenly. suddenly. Slowly then suddenly. You've got to invest on the front end to make this work on the back end. All right. So any questions about farming? The next one we talked about in the 3612-3 class was agent-to-agent -agent referrals. Is anybody here doing agent-to-agent -agent referrals on a, on a regular, consistent lead generation basis? I do them when I can, but not, I mean, I don't have enough to do them consistently today. All right, we have to be, we have to be strategic about this. We use command, we go in, we look at areas. Command will show you, let me see if I can stop sharing and show you this cool font feature that you may not know that command. Does anybody know that you can see migration patterns in command? No. I know we can, but I don't know how to do it. Okay, well, let's look at that real quick. Does that sound like a plan? So you can see where people from Indiana move to and where people moved from to get to Indiana. I'm just getting to my command because I wasn't logged in. Um, and if you were to find that a lot of people from a certain area moved to Indianapolis, then how could you lead generate for agent to agent referral business? Then I would just reach out, like, just say, I don't know, um, people from San Francisco moved to Indianapolis because of the better cost of living. Then I would reach out to agents in that San Francisco area and say, hey, just want to introduce myself. I'm a fellow Keller agent in Indianapolis. I've just noticed that, you know, there's a lot of people from your area that might move to my area. I, you know, make myself available to help you and your clients and I'm happy to pay you a referral fee. Okay, is that one communication or how many times a year do you think you should communicate with those agents after you've made contact? I think it's another 36 touch. It's an, at least a minimum of 36 touch. You have got to wish them happy birthday. You have got to be friends with them on Facebook. They have got to be in your database. You have to have them on smart plans, right? You might have smart plans that reach out to them and say, hey, how's your business? Oh my gosh, it's the beginning of fourth quarter. Can you believe it's the beginning of fourth quarter? What's the market like in your area, right? You have got to create, what is the magic word? It begins with an R. Lead generation is all about what? Relationships. 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 So if you're going to have a referral, an agent to agent referral business, you have got to figure out how to create relationships. How long is it going to take them to forget you? 13 days. I think it's probably less because how many real estate agents do they know? Oh, right. Wow. You have got to show up on their radar. And if you show them that you're going to communicate with them regularly and consistently while you're waiting for the business, how comfortable are they going to feel sending you their clients? Right. They're going They're to know you're a, you're going to follow up. Yes. Right. So you, you can't, there's no hit and miss here. Right. It's super simple. It's just not easy. Right. Like it's just the way it is. All right. So you're going to go into command. And remember, if you don't know what these applets are, all you have to do is click the little red box and it's gonna open up for you and you're looking for referrals, okay? When you click on referrals, this is where you could go if you had um, somebody that was moving to San Francisco, Joni, and you wanted to find an agent that you could send your client to, you could do that. But you can also go here and you can click on, I think it's map. Maybe not, maybe I don't know how to do this, hang on. Map and referral patterns, okay? So we're gonna click on referral patterns. 
And here it's, well, yeah, this is fun. 6% of people move from Greenwood, Indiana to Indianapolis, Indiana. Probably not a great referral pattern, right? Not probably where you want to look. But look down here. A lot of people are moving from Greenwood, Indiana to Firestone, Colorado, right? So why would we want to be looking for where people from Indiana are moving to? Because we want to find agents there to connect them with. Right. And do you think that if you send them business, they're more likely to send you business as well, right? Remember the two-way street. So don't just think about who can send me business. Think about what you can send back out. How many of you guys would like to get 25% of a commission for a phone call? Right. Maybe. That's what that is, right? I, I so and I have, and it's amazing. Yeah. I mean, it just checked. It just shows up. Right. But look, we got, we got lots going on in Colorado. You guys need to be finding agents in Colorado and be friends with them. Right. You got lots going on to Florida. Right. You got, you also got some Kentucky in here, some Michigan, Kalamazoo, Michigan. So you figure this out. Another strategy that I've heard people say is they take all the major cities in the country. They go and Google all the major cities in the country and they create relationships with one or two agents in every major country, every major city in the country, right? If this is going to be one of your three to five sources of lead generation, what do you need to do? You need to have a plan and invest You need in. to have a plan. And then what else do you need to do? What is your, what has to happen on your calendar? Ooh, time block it. Time block it, right? So we got to have it on our calendar. We have to time block it. So our lead generation is from nine to 11. And maybe Mondays and Wednesdays, we focus on agent to agent referrals. Or maybe once a month, we were focused on agent to agent referrals after we get our system set up. This isn't going to be a highly intensive but do you think that four phone calls a year to an agent that says checking in just saying, hey, how's business going for you? I was thinking about you the other day. I saw something about Colorado and I was thinking about you. How's the market in your area? Is that creating a relationship? So if you're going to do agent to agent referrals, you need to do it, right? You have to be 100% committed to it. You can't just reach out to three agents, get no referrals and go, yeah, that didn't work. Right. That's not, that's not going to work. That's not how that works. Right. So, all right. So any questions about agent to agent referrals? Uh, just an example, like I, my son and daughter-in-law are moving to um, one of the suburbs in Chicago. So I went on to Keller and I looked for an agent in that area. I looked for someone who did a lot of business. I added them to my referral network and reached out to them. They reached back out to me. And, you know, when my son and daughter-in-law buy a house, I'm going to get 25%. Awesome. Okay. Now, are they in your database? Yes. They're in your database. And are, do you have them on smart plans? I do not have them on smart plans. I have them in my database um, as a referral, as, as, as they're tagged as a realtor. Okay. And that's the only tag they have is realtor. Awesome. Okay. And then they're also, when you, in your command, you have the, um, your, re, my referral network is a whole tab. So I can awesome. see other people who yeah. have accepted. So, so all you've got the beginnings of it, right? Mm -hmm. So as far as having a plan, you got to figure out where do you want referral relationships? And then how am I going to create a relationship? And then how am I going to sustain that relationship? How am I going to feed that relationship? I have this thought about relationships and I'll tell you, it comes from my counselor. I've seen the same guy for, I don't know, 20 years and he, his name is Patrick and I have Patrickisms. And one of my favorite Patrickisms, uh, I have never thought about this, how much this applies to lead generation until this exact moment, but it's called the bucket theory. And in between every two people, there is this imaginary bucket and both people put things in the bucket and then in a, in a healthy relationship, in a relationship, both people put things in the bucket and then when one person needs something, they can go to the bucket and get something out, right? So think about your relationships. How much are you putting in the bucket, right? Are you putting enough in the bucket that they're even going to know the bucket's there, that they will come when they need you, right? And that's what you're looking for here is that kind of relationship where they know they can count on you if they need your help. That's what we're, that's all lead generation is. That is all it is, is finding people that you can have relationships with. 
A lot of people think lead generation is finding people that we can do what? Buy or sell a house. Buy or sell a house. If you think that lead generation is looking for somebody that wants to buy or sell a house right now, how long are you going to be in business? Oh. Right now, maybe. Not right. very long. But if you think of lead generation as building relationships so that they can count on you when they need your help, it may take, this is where slowly then suddenly comes in, right? You're going to do this for a period of time and then those relationships are going to start paying off, right? Armand, what do you have to say? I was just going to ask, of course, when you do your, when you go through your leads, you're looking for, you're looking for at that as well. If they're going to move to a different city, uh, you're finding out where they're going to move to and that, what they want to move to and uh, the reason for them moving and that kind of thing. But if you've got, let's say Denver, Colorado was the only one uh, that had the referral lines. Mm -hmm. How would you target for those people that are moving to Denver? Because they would want if they would want to know that somebody's targeting them, they would more likely uh, give you the referral or give you the business to do the referral if they knew you were uh, specifically looking for that. Because okay, so let's time. talk about that. What what could you do to let your sphere know that you had relationships with people in Denver? We have an office in Denver. Yeah, but how could you get that message out to your sphere? Smart plans. Smart plans, that'd be great. Hey, do you realize that I'm at Keller Williams? Keller Williams is not only the number one real estate brokerage in the United States, it is the number one brokerage in the world, right? We have offices in 58 countries. So no matter where you're moving, I can help you, right? How do you get that message out? Smart plans, how else? Uh, social media. Yeah. Social media, Facebook Live. How about this? How about you get with a referral partner that you have created a relationship with and you do a Facebook Live together on both your Facebooks, right? How about you do that? Like you have to think outside the box. How can you get that message out? Lead generation is about phone calls, but lead generation, remember it's prospecting based, marketing enhanced, right? Facebook Live, that's a cheap, that's a cheap um, opportunity for, um, a cheap opportunity for marketing, right? Facebook, social media. All right, so agent to referrals. This is one to think about. Open houses. How many of you guys are doing open houses? How many of you have a system, a consistent system around doing open houses? Tell me, tell me this, Rob. Tell me what's this about it. Well, I've, like, I've been, like I said, I was shadowing another agent just because of where I was in real estate. So I learned things from her, but now that I'm in this office, I'm also learning, so I'm picking up things from the people in this office so it's just changing as i'm getting more and more open houses um and i'm learning the things i don't want to do anymore things i do okay. want to do um <laughs> so it's it evolving is, systems yeah. can evolve over time right but so many agents this is what they do they say yeah i'm gonna have an open house and they 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 put it on facebook or they put it on the internal facebook page and somebody reaches out to them and they show up or that's their open house. And then they're and then they're upset because nobody showed up. Right? Well, what'd you do to get somebody to show up? Sometimes you can your business might turn out by accident once or twice, but does anybody here want your business to be by accident? Mm -hmm. No. So we have to have a system. I, I I open houses was the way I lead generated, but I had a very systematic way that I approached it. On Mondays, I reached out to the agents that I wanted to have open houses for. I looked specifically for homes that were vacant or staged because that way, if they pended before the weekend, I had a better chance of still being able to hold it open. I would have that conversation with the listing agent, right? If, uh, if this pens before the weekend, will I still be able to hold it open, right? Because if not, I'm probably going to look for a different one instead, 
because I really want to make sure that I'm protected. Because on Tuesday, I mailed out lime green letters to everyone in the neighborhood. I learned this from Shauna Brooks, lime green paper, lime green envelopes, and people showed up at my open houses with these invitations in hand. So I know it worked, right? Lime green. Lime green is a magic color for open houses for some reason. And then on, on Wednesday, I started posting it on my Facebook. On Thursdays, I started making phone calls to the neighbors. And my script for phone calls would just be like, I don't know if you noticed the na your neighbor has their house for sale. And I was just calling to see, would you like to choose your new neighbors? That was my script. Every time they'd laugh, they thought it was funny. We'd have a conversation. I'd invite them to come, invite, bring their people from work. Anybody they wanted to be their neighbor, invite them to come to the open house. On Fridays, I put my signs out and I only door knock. So a lot of people door knock. I only door knock the places where I put signs. So if I was putting a sign in somebody's yard, I door knocked to ask permission. If I could not get permission, if they didn't answer the door, I left a note on their door that said, I have left a sign in your yard. I, I hope that's okay. If it's not, here's my phone number. Would you please call me and I will come pick my sign up. I do not need to be, I did not want to be an inconvenience and I really wanted to get your permission first. They would call me only once that they have me remove my sign that I can think of, but they would call me because they would say, oh my gosh, nobody has ever asked permission. I have lived here for however many years and people have put my signs in there, my in, signs in my yard forever. And I sold two houses that were just sign people that I knocked on the door. They remembered me. They remembered me longer than 13 days because I did something that nobody else had ever done for them, you know, was ask their permission. And Afterwards, when I pulled their sign, I sent thank you cards to them, thanking them for letting me use their yard. Big thing. This is a system, right? I had a very systematic approach. The day of the open house, I invited the neighbors to come 30 minutes before. So if I was having two to four, I invited the neighbors to come at 1.30. Why? Because it made them feel special, right? It, remember, it's not what you do. Sometimes it's what, how, what, what's most how, important. How it makes people feel makes people feel that made them feel special. I came early so that the neighbors could come and not have to deal with the riffraff, right? <laughs> like whatever, you know? Um, so I had a system. I had a system when they came into the open house about collecting their information and about trying to get them to download my app. I had a system in place. So you have to have a system. I also had a goal every month. I wanted to do on average four open houses a week. If my weekend didn't work out that I could do that, then I would do Thursday night open houses. And then I really realized that I loved Thursday night open houses. My system was different for Thursday night open houses. I had fewer people come to Thursday night open houses. However, the people that more of my business came from Thursday night open houses than weekend open houses because I didn't get looky loose, right? I only got people that were serious. Also, how many signs are you putting out? On your signs, are you putting balloons? Are you doing something to capture people's attention, right? You have to have a system around open houses. If you just stick a sign in the yard and show up, your business is gonna be by accident. It's that simple. So if you're gonna do open houses, you gotta to commit to it. Like you gotta commit all in and be consistent. Yes, Armand. How is your system different for Thursday night houses? Well, Thursday nights, I couldn't get the, they didn't get yellow, they didn't get neighborhood letters. They only got Wednesday night phone calls. I couldn't, I couldn't get the mail out in time for them to get it on Thursday and make that work. Um, the other thing on Thursday was I tried to put twice as many directional signs out because my directional signs on the weekend, I put those out on Fridays. That was usually, I was doing two on Saturday, one on Sunday, if I was doing a Thursday. I could take all of those signs and put them out for the Thursday. So my Thursday open house had a lot, a lot of directionals because I was looking for accidents. I was looking for the people who weren't sure they were ready to buy yet. They weren't thinking about buying. And I, on Thursdays, I got very few agents. Like I got very few people who were, had agents already because they just came across it because I had so many signs out. That was what was different about Thursdays. Also, Thursday open houses were easier to get. And, and here's another thing. If somebody tells you, well, we already, I already have an open house scheduled on Saturday, we'll say, that's, that's fine. What time is it? And they'd say 12 to 2. And I say, okay, can I do 3 to 5? Same day. 
the people that would come from 12 to two aren't going to come from three to five, right? I, it's, you know, here's the other thing. People tell me this, I didn't get any good leads. Well, I was doing on average three to four open houses a week and I was getting one good lead a week. I didn't get a good lead at every open house. I had open houses that nobody showed up no matter what I did. Um, so, so there's that. The other thing I did with open houses is that when the house sold, I had the neighbors, right? I'd already, I'd already had one round of communication with the neighbors. So when the house sold, I would call them up and say, I just wanted to let you know your neighbor's house pended, right? We have more buyers that would like to live in that area. Do you happen to know anybody else in the neighborhood that's looking to sell? So that was just another lead generation phone call from my open house endeavors. Another yes, good, Another good idea about the uh when you put out directional signs, you put out as many as you can. Uh, try to go to at least one very major street mm -hmm. and, and direct them in from that. If you can yeah. do two. Yeah, absolutely. If a neighborhood has two entrances at two majors, make sure you're coming from both ways. Yeah. And those little cheap, they're cheap little signs. I mean, you can even go, you don't have to have branded signs. You can go to Menards and buy or Lowe's or Home Depot and buy the red and white open house directionals, right? Like you're just trying to get them there. You know, name recognition is nice, but you're just really trying to get them there. That's all that matters. So that's open houses. All right. Fizbos and expireds. Now we, a lot of times, whenever we talk about these, we talk about them together, but they're really two different things, right? two different conversations, two different scripts. I wouldn't do what I would, I would, if I, this is what I was going to do, I'm going to decide which do I want. What's the, what's the advantage of calling for sale by owners and expireds, having that be a source of lead generation? Because in some way, somehow they wanted to sell their house. They've, they've, raised already, their they've already made the decision to sell their they've, house. They've raised their hand and said, I want to sell. So you've got, you know, willing and able right? You may not exactly have ready, but you have willing and able, right? Or hopefully you have able, you at least have willing, <laughs> okay? You at least have willing, right? You got that in place. So for sale by owners, they've raised their hand. They've said, I want to sell my house. And what else have they said? That they're not using a real estate agent? They've said, I don't need an agent, right? So our script around that and our system around for sale by owners is to show them that they need us, right? So is this a one conversation and done kind of lead generation? No. No. How many touches do you think it takes for a for sale by owner? Oof. And it's not 36, by the way, this isn't a 36 <laughs> touch program. It's a 12 Eight. direct. Oh. It's a 12 direct, oh. right? I think a 12 direct. And you have to have a system around it. like. You know, you're going to call them and have a script for your first call. And then maybe you're going to mail them something, something of value that would help them. And then you have to decide some people that do for sale by owners, they do open houses for their for sale by owners. So they have an open house strategy for for sale by owners, right? So you, get, you just got to figure out what your system is around for sale by owners. I'm not a for sale by owner expert. We have a video on it. We've had, there's tons of resources and materials out there for for sale by owners. If you want to do for sale by owners, guess what you have to do? You have to have a system and you have to commit to it. It's the long game, right? You may call one and they say, yes, it could happen, but really it's going to be the long game. And you may invest time in one that manages to sell it on their own. Now, if they sell it on their own, what might they need help with? Title company, um, insurance, yeah, making they may sure the help. person who says they, you know, giving them the tip to call the lender and see if the pe person can really afford it. They may need help getting across the line, but what else might they help, might they need help with that would get you a commission? Buying another oh, house. Oh, they have to buy, right? So even though they want to for sale by owner, they know that the seller is going to pay the buyer's commission. So can I at least help you buy your new home, right? That's the advantage. Not everybody that's selling needs to buy, but if you call for sale by owners, one of the things that I think a lot of agents forget to offer is I'm not calling. I, I realize you're going to sell your home on your own. I'm calling to see if you need any help with that. But what I'm really calling to see is where are you moving to? And can I help you with that? Right? That's a good script for a for sale by owners. All right, expires. 
there are a lot, there haven't been many in the last year or two, but if you watch my boar, uh, there are more and more on a regular basis. And if you call those for sale by, or those expired, what you may find if you call them first thing in the morning before other agents have called them is that they don't even realize that they're off the market. They don't even realize they expired, but this is an early bird catches the worm kind of game. You have got to call them early or figure out another way to stand out. Don't call them, show up, right? Show up on the doorstep in the first thing in the morning with a consolation prize. Sorry, your house didn't sell. Let me see, you know, I specialize in selling houses that didn't sell the first time. Like figure out what your system is. Again, it is all about a system. You have got to have a system in place if you're gonna make this happen. All right, so what else do we have in here as far as 36.12.3 prospecting? Well, what other kinds of lead generation you guys think about? Um, I was just wondering, like, what about old, what about old expires? Do you know, like, what, like, um, is that still something, like, do they always have to be brand new? Can, like, they don't have to be brand new. What you would need to do is you need to do a little research. Sometimes they expire and still sell. Yeah, like, so, because yeah. uh, there was one I was looking into um, last night, and when I looked into the uh, the history of it, I typed it right back into the address back in the MLS. It never, it never seems like it was sold again. Like yeah, it never want to check the tax again. records though, because sometimes it expires and then they sell it on their own and it doesn't end up back uh, in the okay. MLS. Check the tax records. Okay. If you're gonna, if you're gonna do old expireds, two things. One, you're gonna have to do some research, so you're gonna have some some research time involved. And research time, by the way, does not count as lead generation. That has to be right. a different time block on your calendar. If you spend all your time researching, you didn't lead generate, you researched, right? That's right. not lead generation. So you're going to have a separate place on your calendar for that. And then you're going to call them. Your script's going to be different, right? You're, you're going to find out why. I see that your house was on the market and I was wondering why didn't it sell? Well, you know, what, did you change your mind or was there an issue? What happened? Like you're going to have to do, you're going to have to ask lots of questions to figure that, to figure that out. Okay. Here's another one. Here's another one. Probate. Mm. What's the advantage of probate? They have to sell it or they can't sell the estate. Yeah, they have to sell. The downside to probate is that somebody's going to accuse you of being an ambulance chaser. You're going to have to have a really good script and you're going to have to have really thick skin because it's. And you are going to be thrust you can be, it's possible that you are then thrust in the middle of a family dispute. Family drama. Mm -hmm. Death and money bring out the worst in people. I'm uh -huh. telling you. All right. There's also a chance that you're going to have a whole other set of issues, right? You're going to have hoarding issues, house needs to be cleaned out, maintenance issues as is. I mean, there's going to be a whole, you're going to need to have it. First quarter for um, the 12 weeks to success this year and first quarter next year, we're going to work on our vendor books. We need to have vendor books so that we can be this person. But if you are doing probate, you have got to have really good vendors because mm -hmm. that's what's going to set you aside from everyone else. Um, and there are um, a couple of not very expensive uh people that you can pay that will that will go comb the court records and get you the personal representatives. Um, you can also have a probate business by making relationships with who? Attorneys. Attorneys, right? Or probably the attorney's paralegal because you're not going to probably be able to make a relationship with an attorney. But the paralegal, the legal administrator, that's that's who's going to control the workflow anyways. Um, I have heard stories of agents that take pizzas to the law firms. They take donuts to the law firms. They do these things to create relationships, right? Referral relationships. Um, I was a seniors. My business was seniors. I did networking. I networked with other businesses that supported seniors. So nursing homes, you know, hearing aid companies, um, assisted living, all of those kind of people. And I created referral relationships with other businesses. That is a, that is a source of lead generation. Now I had referral relationships. How many touches did I have with the people that I was in referral relationship with? 
at least 36. Exactly. They had smart plans. I kept in touch with them, right? Oh, gotcha. I had to create relationships. You can't create relationships by saying, here's my business card. Is that a relationship? No. All right, what else? What else can you guys think of as far as where you could get business from? Funeral homes. Um, homes. Oh, I'm sorry, was somebody a second? Oh, what were you gonna say? I was gonna say um, seminars. Like workshops, yeah. like home buyer seminars. Oh, yes, that's a really good one. Here, look, this comes out today. It's available on uh, Ink, Red Ink, whatever that's called, the Ink, Keller, Keller Ink. On Keller Ink, this is available today. Your first home, it is, I haven't read it yet. I have the old version of it. They've redone it. You could do first time home buyer seminars, right? Um, guess what you have to have in order to do first time home buyer seminars? Um, that book? Are you going to really say that book? <laughs> oh, you have to have a system. Oh, there's, yeah, so a system. There's a theme today. It is you have to have a system. You have to be consistent and you have to be focused on relationships. It, that is lead generation, right? If that's all it is, you have got to figure out what works for you. So think about, make a list. These are things I don't like to do. I do not like to cold call. So none of my lead generation had cold calling involved in it. It's just something I realized. I did cold call, right? And here's the beautiful thing. This is my little pitch right now. If you haven't registered for the first step of bold, I sent you guys, I think all the link, either register for full board bold, which is really investing in yourself. But if you, you're not ready to do that yet, at least register for the first step to bold because it's free. You will get a lot out of it. But I will tell you that as much as I did not want to cold call, I cold called while I was in bold because it's part of bold. You're going to get a little uncomfortable. Where does growth happen? Uncomfortable. And you're in, in an uncomfortable zone. Yeah, that's where growth happens. I did it and I realized after I did it, I didn't ever want to do it again. <laughs> I'm just being serious. I'm going to be honest. I did not want to, I'm not calling for sale by owners. I didn't want to do that. That's not my personality. Instead, I am, I like, they call it belly to belly, which kind of gives me the willies, but I like being with people in person. So open houses and networking really worked well for me. And when I started thinking about networking, that's how I ended up with seniors because I could network with a group of people that had contact with a uh, people that had a need for my services, right? So that's how I chose how I lead generated. I had database, open houses, seniors. And you want to know how I ended up being a coach? COVID, database and seniors were my lead generation. COVID hit. We weren't doing open houses and seniors weren't moving. They offered me the opportunity to be a coach and that's how I ended up being a coach. <coughs> but COVID won't happen again, so you guys are safe. Pick what works for you, right? Pick what works for you. But then you have to commit to it. You have to have a system around it and remember that it's a long game because it's about relationships. All right, so Rob, you'd like this. What are your lead generation sources right now? Open houses, cold calling, and I've been trying to figure out what else I'm... Okay. How I want to do What are some of the ideas that you're playing with? Um... I want to get back involved with things I did in the past and I just haven't done it yet, but like networking face-to-face -face, in-person things. So I want to join different sporting groups. I'm trying to join some dance groups, like just things that interest me so I can get involved in those groups and just start building those relationships there. Cause like I came from New York, so my database isn't as strong as I would like it to be here. So just getting to know those people again, it's just hard. It's just a hard thing to starting a business and getting, trying to get other activities ingrained is just very hard for me right at the moment. I love that. You just raised a really good point. If you pick something that you enjoy, right? If it's something else that's not business related, that's something that you enjoy or something that's business related that you enjoy, you're going to be much more likely to stay consistent, right? And you have the immediate foundation 
of a relationship because you have something in common. So if you find people that also like to do pickleball or curling or whatever sport it is, right? You know, the common sports, I was trying to think outside the box, right? Like if I found people that were, that like to do curling, I there was a guy that I worked with in my corporate world and he was a, he liked to curl you know, with the brooms and the things. And he had such a close knit group of people because those people were apparently very like-minded on other things. Apparently, if you like to curl your, you like other things that are similar, like there was other common interests so that you have to remember in order for somebody to do business with you, they have to know you like you trust you know, you like you trust you. Right. If you find somebody that's got common interests, no like and trust is a whole lot easier, right? It's just, it's natural, it's inherent. So Rob, I love that. So how can you find these type of relationship? How can you find these type of opportunities for that relationship? Well, what I've been doing is relying on social media first to get my ends. So like, I also went to the state fair, so I know a couple of dance groups that were there. I've already emailed them, and I'm trying to get into their courses and classes. So all most of that is just research through the internet and reaching out through the internet to make the connections and then going to join. I love it. And then you have to have a system to collect information, right? Because mm-hmm. what you're eventually going to have, Rob, whether you realize it or not, is a database business, right? Mm-hmm. If you think about it, all the lead generation that we've been talking about ultimately ends up being what? A database business, right? The people you meet at open houses become part of your database. The people that you meet networking become part of your database. The people that you farm, if you farm a neighborhood, become part of your database. Your agents that you do agent to agent referrals with become part of your database. If you're going to do a vendor referral business, it's going to be Become part of your database and this database class is very timely that we're teaching uh this this month because it's all about that right once you get their information you have to get their information you have to get it in your database and then you have to have lead generation around building relationships with those people so it really all boils down to your database and how are you going to get people in there right that's all this is did I mention su- super simple, not easy, right? It requires the effort and consistency. When you meet strangers at the grocery store, do you have a system for getting their contact information into your database? Mm-hmm. What might a system be if you're standing in line at the grocery store with your name tag on? And if you're not wearing your name tag into your grocery into the grocery store, start doing that right now. Because people will say, are you in real estate? I definitely have gotten stock from wearing, I have, it's so funny you said that because I have to go grocery shopping today, but I'm also wearing a red day shirt, um, Keller Williams version. And I have been stopped before because of that, but I definitely, I'm going to make sure I wear my tag, my name tag. Put your name tag in your car. It hangs on my rear view mirror so that I remember before I get on my car to put my name tag on. 50% of the time while I'm in the store, somebody will ask me, are you in real estate, right? Are you in real estate? I say, yeah, how'd you know? And they'll say your name tag. And I'm like, oh goodness, did I leave that on? <laughs> and then, and then they'll say, um, well, how's the market? And I have an answer. You guys all need to know you have, I have to have an answer for how's the market. And my, the end of my answer for how's the market, but the short version is the market's great. Doesn't matter whether you're a buyer or seller. This is the perfect time to sell, perfect time to buy. And here's why, which are you a buyer or a seller? And they're going to say, well, I'm neither. I was just wondering. And I'll be like, okay, well, let me ask you a question. Do you know anybody who might need my help in real estate? Other question I'd love to ask is, okay, well, let me ask you a question. If you did have a real estate need, do you have a go-to person? Right? Do you have a go-to person? They're going to tell me no. Then I'm going to say, well, what would it take for me to be your go-to person? What would it take for me to be that person? Right? And all I need is your contact information and I can set you up, right? I'll make sure I'm always there for you if you need help. But you got to have a system, whether it's a, my system, just so you know, my system is in, con- it's, I'm old school, right? Not old school business card wise, because that doesn't get me their information, but I'm old school because I don't have some fancy digital card. I set myself up as a contact in my phone and it says Carla Higgins, realtor. 
actually now it says Carla has the key Higgins realtor because people started recognizing Carla has the key. And so I'll say, well, I don't have any cards on me, but let me text you my card, my contact information. You can just save it in your phone. And I, it says realtor. So if you can't remember my name, it's no big deal. If you just type in realtor, you'll find me right now. Guess what I have? Cause I'm going to text to them. I have their phone number and I say, okay. And remind me, what's your name again? Right. And if, if the converse, if the line's really long at the grocery store, I'm going to go ahead and say, well, what's your address? Cause what I'd love to do is send you what's going on in your neighborhood. Like, have you ever pulled in your neighborhood and saw a sign and wondered how much the house was worth? Well, I could send that to you once a month. Would you like that? Now I got everything I need, right? Have a system for collecting their information. That's going to work everywhere. Right. That's going to work when you're doing dance. That's going to work when you're playing sports. That's going to work when you're sitting at a sporting event, like mm -hmm. go to a Colts game. Like I have a tag in my database that is Colts. I used to have season tickets at the Colts and I have all the people that sit around me. I have all their contact information in my database and I tagged them Colts so that, you know, when we tie, I can send a message. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Was this helpful? Does this have you thinking about your lead generation now? Matt, what's your three sources, three to five sources? Um, really right now, it's just my sphere. Um, I have talked to, you know, some people out and about at the, you know, the grocery store or whatnot. Um, I've had one person, well, actually two people approached me um, one time because I was wearing my name tag. Um, so I guess that's one, that's not really a big one, but I guess that's something I consider is like when I'm out and about, that's one way I try to, um, I don't know, manifest <laughs> people to come to me and whatnot. Um, a third one, um, I, I'm kind of like with Rob, I need to start, I, I, beginning of this year, I was playing volleyball like four nights a week at a couple different places, but I've gotten away from that um like this whole summer um uh, so i need to get back and doing that to you know re uh, kindle those relationships i had with all those people i played with um and then also coaching too i used to coach volleyball um so that's another thing too i need to get back into and like get back to that sphere get all those parents and everything um i mean that's, that's really about it for me right now um I, I love that. Here's the thing. Why did, why does Gary tell us in the millionaire real estate agent three to five? What happens if we try 10 different things? You can't, you can't be consistent. You can't do it. You, you're not going to be good at any of them, right? You're going to be mediocre at everything. So pick three, pick one. Here's the thing. Pick one and get good at it. Then add the second, get good at it. Pick three and get good at it. And then this grocery store thing is an ancillary. It's a fourth or fifth, right? It yeah. becomes who you are, right? Real estate becomes part of your identity and who you are. And those, that's just your database business. And that's just growing your database, right? So there's, that's one, but you know, so Rob, you don't have a sphere local right you, you do have a sphere and that works out the agent to agent relationship yeah. that mean that might be something for you but here's the thing you got to try it you got to commit so pick three whatever it is pick three and commit right and commit at least six months and make sure that you have a system it's on your calendar it's time blocked and you're consistent right and then if it doesn't work for you because a you hate it it's drudgery debbie <laughs> Debbie, generation, drudgery, right? If it's drudgery, then find another way. Because if it's drudgery, drudgery I couldn't long, find my mute button. <laughs> drudgery. I couldn't how find long my are mute you going to do it if it's drudgery? My Friday, I started my own networking group for seniors because there really wasn't one on the South side. And I spent two and a half hours every Friday with this group of people. And I felt guilty because I wasn't working, but I was, and it was lead generation, but I enjoyed it so much that I had to question myself, right? Because my instinct was to feel guilty that I wasn't really working. And I was, but I was enjoying it, right? Isn't there, there's a famous athlete. Somebody know who that is? Is it Kobe Bryant or somebody that says that when you, when you find a job that you love to do, it, it becomes not work. 
-hmm. you know there's some i don't know what the saying is i've just completely bastardized something that somebody said because play what is it matt and like uh i think a lot of people have said it but it's like don't look at it as work like look at it as like play or fun and then you like you don't work a day in your life yeah that's it you won't work a day in your life if you find something to do for work that you love that's kind of it right especially if you're going to be doing it every day like you got to make it fun so find a way to make it fun for yourself yeah i uh i saw this quote maybe two years ago it was right before i got my license and it really sticks with me it's like i can do anything i want but not everything i want absolutely that's and i i definitely am a person who suffers like i want to do so many things that then nothing gets done well but that's a good place to end guys all right partner meeting south office we are going to have an amazing partner meeting that's all about social media which we didn't even talk about today so do that alicia i have no idea you always have stellar partner meetings in louisville so um yes ma'am it's it's right now so i'm gonna be (laughs) All right, guys. Well, thank you so thank much you, for being here. And I will see you guys. I'll be on. Uh, no, Laura will be on at five if you need help. Thank you. Uh, I had to leave for an Ojo call. So that was exciting. Oh, yay. And now I need investment property. So call me, anybody that's still there. <laughs> Very good. With investment properties. All right. Thanks, Carla. Have a good day. All right. Bye bye.